Hey everybody, and welcome to Unit 7, I want to say. I think this is Unit 7 off the top of my head. We're talking about the basics of learning, and we are going to be kind of starting at the very, very basics of how we are able to learn, how we are able to create associations between two or more objects. We're going to be spending the next couple of units doing this. Uh, so the, the first unit that we're talking about today, we're going to be talking about some of the very basic kind of neural mechanisms that allow us to learn, which includes some of the very beginning pieces of classical conditioning. Um, next unit, we're going to be taking that a step further. We're going to learn about classical conditioning and also talk about generalization and discrimination. And then finally, the final unit of this kind of three unit piece, we'll be talking about neuroplasticity. So we're going to be talking a lot about how the brain changes as a function of experience. So one of the reasons why I'm really excited to tackle this particular unit is, or the set of units is because so far we've really kind of had a cognitive perspective on memory. Um, and that's just my background. I'm a cognitive psychologist and so, and a lot of memory research is done by cognitive psychologists. But there's more to memory than just cognitive psychology. Um, and actually, before I became a cognitive psychologist, I feel like I became a cognitive psychologist somewhere in grad school. Um, before that, I was definitely more kind of learning oriented. My undergraduate mentor was a guy who was very behaviorist, um, which I think my cognitive psychology class might be surprised to hear. Um, but um, I just wanted to point out that when we, when we talk about memory in other domains, like learning or applied behavior analysis, that the kind of memory, we just talk about it in a different way. Usually we'll, we'll talk about it in learning context, we'll talk about things like stimulus strength or stimulus control as a measurement of how much does a stimulus affect your behavior further down the line, you know, like um, in the future. Um, and I think that whenever you kind of look at it that way, it really does kind of feel like memory. Another example, maybe it's a little bit easier of an example, would be like taste aversion. So I'm going to write this out actually while I'm, while I'm thinking about it. Uh, so if you've ever eaten something and then gotten sick later, let's say that you ate some cheeseburger macaroni and then you got sick immediately after that, how are you going to feel the next time you smell cheeseburger macaroni? You're probably going to get a little bit queasy, right? Well, in that case, think about what memory is, right? Memory is retrieving some kind of information that was previously, you know, presented to us. And if that is the memory, if that's the definition of memory in, the, in its broadest sense, then isn't that also taste aversion that whenever you are encountering that cheeseburger macaroni, your body feels queasy and nauseated, right? How is that different than implicit learning? It's not really, right? Um, so that's kind of the perspective that we're going in on uh, for the next uh, couple of units. And the reason why I am emphasizing all of this is because this is actually going to help us see how at a neural level, so whenever you look at the neural, the neurons in the brain, how they change to create memories, this is where it all starts. So that's why we're getting so nitty gritty now. So as we kind of move forward, I want you to be thinking about that definition about what is a memory and what isn't a memory. Um, because a behavior that doesn't require some form of memory would be a behavior that doesn't require some form of learning, right? Um, and can you think of any like that? One of, the, one of the articles that we read at the very beginning of class, I thought had a some really great examples of what could be a memory and one of them was an allergen right that like if you get exposed to something and later on you get exposed to that same thing and you have an allergic reaction to it because of the antibodies that were created the first time you experienced it isn't that kind of like a memory and I guess maybe you could argue that you know maybe it had maybe you were going to require that it you know involves the central nervous system maybe, um, but I think you know memory encompasses so much of our behavior. It's worth kind of thinking about well what behaviors don't require some memory, and one that came to my mind was a reflex. So a reflex is just this innate and involuntary kind of behavior that we have. And the, the key words here, 
innate and involuntary. Let's think about what that means. Basically, it's innate, meaning that we don't need to learn it. There's no learning necessary, uh, that we're kind of born equipped with these reflexes. And it's also involuntary, meaning that you do it whether you like it or not. So a lot of these examples come to us through childhood development. So if you've taken that class, um, then you're probably really familiar with a lot of these. Like the, uh, the rooting reflex. The rooting reflex is whenever you um, uh, stimulate the cheek of a uh, young child, that young child will orient towards it and then try to put that stimulus in its mouth. Um, another could be the, um, uh, uh, what is it called, the, is it the ATNR uh, reflex, where like, uh, sometimes they call it the fencing reflex, where if you have a baby's head like this while they're laying down, they're going to kind of involuntarily go like this, but the moment you move their head this way, they move their arms like this, like that, and then if you move their head this way, then they move their arms like that. Um, that's a reflex. Another one that you see right here is the grasping reflex. You put something in a baby's hand and, oh man, they have like incredible grip. It's like, the, you know, uh, uh, some kind of death grip on, on your finger. Uh, you can't get undone. The baby doesn't need to learn that. The baby, its, it's, it's, it's central nervous system comes prepackaged with that kind of reflex, with that kind of behavior. But because we don't have to have any kind of prior experience with it, I think that it's safe to say that these are behaviors that do not require a memory. Uh, another reflex, like the patellar reflex on your knee, whenever you go to the doctor and they have you, uh, they, they hit that little mallet and they hit that part of your knee to see if, it, if your leg moves. Again, that's kind of a, a reflex, but I wanted to give you one that was maybe more adult and not just for children. Um, all right, so the most important research animal that we're gonna be talking about uh, for the next couple of units. Um, can you guess what it is? You may say maybe it's a dog because of Pavlov's dogs and we're talking about classical conditioning. And that's not exactly what I'm looking for. And you may say, well, I know B.F. Skinner did a lot of work with pigeons. Maybe it's pigeons, but that's actually not what I'm looking for either. The animal that we're going to be talking a lot about the next couple of units is this fella right here. This is an aplesia. This is a uh, sea slug. So that is one of the most important animals that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of units. Why? Why are we talking about sea slugs? I kind of feel like whenever you got, uh, uh, you know, whenever you decided to become a psych major, it's not because you wanted to learn about sea slugs. But that's okay. Let me try. To give me, give me a couple of minutes to try to convince you why they're important and why they're worth learning about. So um, sea slugs are incredibly important for our understanding for how the brain works and specifically how the brain changes as a function of experience. So in other words, how any kind of learning takes place, we can come back to the sea slug and thank it dearly for the lessons it's given us. And the reason why people have been using sea slugs is because for one, it has relatively few neurons. We're talking about 20,000 neurons in its entire body, which is, sounds like a lot, but it's actually very, very small, especially when you consider the human brain has about 70 billion uh, uh, neurons. So um, has a whole lot of, uh, actually, 70 million or 70 billion. I'm <laughs> Now I'm, I'm freaking myself out. Let me, let me check how many neurons in the human brain. Yes, it's billion with a B, just making sure. Um, so about 70 billion uh, neurons. 20,000 neurons is so, so much easier to wrap your head around compared to 70 billion neurons. So it's a relatively quote unquote simple species for that reason. So neuroscientists are able to map out its entire ner nervous system because it has so few neurons in it compared to most other uh, species. And it's uh, uh, relatively um, uh, 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 simple in terms of the amount of connections that can be made. We're looking at some muscles that are controlled by as few as two neurons. You don't get anything like that as simple and as simple or as simplistic, I should say, uh, in the human body. Uh, and these neurons are actually relatively large too. It, they're, they're not as, uh, as small as, as what you see in the humans, for example. The other reason is because its behaviors are very rudimentary, which means that there's not a lot of variability in their behavior that you can um, uh, look at the kind of, they only have so many behaviors that they can do 
So it's very easy to look at that behavior. But this is where we start getting some interesting kinds of findings because what I'm going to show you is that even though the sea slug operates with a lot of simple, reflex, simple reflexes, it does learn from its environment. So in other words, it comes, these sea slugs come with these innate behaviors, these reflexes that it has whenever you poke and prod it in certain parts. And even though it doesn't need to learn those behaviors, those behaviors can change over time. And we'll look at that and we'll look at what those neurons in this very simple nervous system are doing to help us understand how experience changes our nervous system. So in order to do that, I want to do a very quick refresher on the human neuron. Now, good chance, you know, most of you are seniors, there's a good chance that you know this stuff. You know, you got a tattoo of a neuron, uh, so I don't have to go into that much detail with it. But I do want to spend some time on it because um, uh, sometimes whenever I, whenever I test this with my cognitive psychology folks, which are usually juniors and seniors as well, um, there's usually some gaps in their knowledge. So I want to make sure that, that we're all, we all are referring to these different you know, pieces correctly. So this is a very simplified neuron. Uh, and let's start over here. Over to the left, we're going to have these little dots, these little chemicals floating in the synapse. And these are going to be the neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are those chemicals that are going to be spread from neuron to neuron. And they are dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, um, GABA, glutamate, um, whatever ones you've heard of before. Um, we got those dendrites, uh, sorry, we got those, those neurotransmitters floating around. In order to communicate with the next neuron, they are going to bind onto these branch-like structures called dendrites. These dendrites are going to be these, you know, massive collection of branches and limbs that these neurotransmitters can bind onto. They, they, they bind onto it and if that cell gets enough of those neuro, uh, of a neurotransmitter, then this cell is going to have a reaction. So we're moving now from the dendrites over to the cell body. The cell body is going to, if you've taken Dr. Manella's class, then all of this stuff is should be, you know, um, second nature to you by now because she really goes deep in on these processes. But if we get enough of those neurotransmitters, then there is a reaction. Um, uh, uh, what we call an integration of that neuron. That we have enough signals that we are going to let in uh, sodium. Uh, we're going to open up the sodium uh, ions to, to depolarize that cell. Uh, whenever that happens, that creates an, uh, base, uh, basically an electrical impulse, what we call an action potential. That action potential is going to start in the cell body, but it's going to fire its way down the length of that axon. So this is that electrical impulse that sometimes you hear people talk about when they talk about the brain, about the electricity in the brain. This is what they're referring to, is that kind of a, um, a, a depolarized cell firing uh, at negative 70 millivolts. Uh, it's moving down the length of that axon, um, and the axon is just kind of like this long tunnel that gets from point A to point B in the neuron, allows it to stretch across a distance. Um, and so whenever that electrical impulse arrives at the end of the axon, then it's going to reach these different axon endings. Axon ending, there are a lot of ways that people talk about this. Sometimes you hear it called axon ending. Sometimes you hear it called uh, the terminal buttons. Or sometimes just the axon terminals, either one is fine, or I guess all three are fine, because people kind of use them interchangeably. But once those, uh, once that electrical impulse hits these buttons, these axon endings, these axon terminals, those axon terminals are going to have neurotransmitters themselves, and they are going to release that out for the next neuron. Does that make sense? So basically, just to recap, you get enough neurotransmitters over here, they bind on to these dendrites, you get enough of them and the cell body is going to decide to fire uh, an action potential. That action potential is going to be 70 millivolts and it's going to travel down the length of this axon. Once it does that, it's going to hit these buttons and encourage the release of neurotransmitters. Um, 
These, uh, these purple things, the myelin sheath, these are just fatty tissues that help insulate that cell um, so that it can help ensure that that charge gets from point A to point B. And that is how a neuron works, or how it normally operates. What we're going to see in the next three units, though, is that this neuron is going to change shape depending on how much is being used. If it doesn't, if it's not used all that much, then maybe it becomes more streamlined. Maybe it is uh, the the next neighboring cell that cells that we have over here. These neurons that we might have over here. Uh, if those connections are going to kind of fall apart, it's going to have a trouble communicating with those neurons maybe. But let's say that this neuron gets a lot of action. If it gets a lot of action, then the reverse happens where we're going to see that this neuron is going to get really efficient at communicating with these neighboring neurons too. And so the phrase here that you're going to see a lot in the neuroplasticity chapter is use it or lose it. So basically, if you use those neural connections, it'll stay, and if you don't, then they go away. Um, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. Uh, all right, so here is kind of what we would imagine where we have one cell, we got all these dendrites around, right? Um, that this one cell is going to be next to a couple of other cells, then those cells are gonna be next to other cells, but actually it's much more complex than that, that there are cells, or there are neurons all throughout the brain, um, firing in all these different directions, hooking into these different networks. It is incredibly complex. It is one of the great mysteries of, uh, of, of science right now is like kind of how do we map the human cortex? How can we account for these 70 billion circuits that are all kind of active and alive and communicating with one another? How can we possibly simulate that using computers? Um, I don't know, if you know, you can make a lot of money trying to figure that out. Uh, and, and and mapping the human brain. So I just wanted to emphasize that even though it can this can look really simple and really straightforward, that the truth of the matter is that the human brain is littered with these neurons that are all communicating with one another. And some of these some of these neurons, their strength they're like so let's let's just say for example, let's say that this cell right here is being active a lot and this cell is terminating over here around these cells. So if this cell is being used a lot, the connection between these cells are going to be strengthened, and if that's true, then the connection is, go then we're gonna see a downstream effect where this cell is gonna fire more frequently as a result, which is going to activate this cell, this cell is going to fire a lot towards this cell, this cell is gonna fire a lot moving back towards this cell, and so on and so forth. So it has a downstream effect whenever we see this stuff in practice. And we'll be talking about sea slugs, and we'll be able to see some of that, some of those changes happen. All right, um, I wanted to show you this kind of uh, uh, replica of, of what's, what's going on in the brain. This is using CGI image, uh, imagery, obviously, um, that's computer generated, but this is maybe a better simulation of what is going on through the brain, where you can see that it's, maybe it's not, not so easy to see what the dendrites are and what the axon terminals are. This is the cell body. Um, so from the cell body, we have all these dendrites that are hungry for neurotransmitters. From there, we have the axon that moves down the length of, or sorry, the, the, the axon that moves down this way. So the action potential is gonna travel down this length, and then it's going to terminate at the end of these axon terminals so that more, neurotrans no more neurotransmitters are kind of spread out into the synapse there. All right, so let's talk about the brain. It is gross, it is a piece of living tissue, and I don't want us to lose sight of that because oftentimes when we're talking about the human brain, I feel like we're talking about it as this really idealized structure that is kind of fixed into place, and uh, it's like a computer, you know, you give it information, it gives you information out, um, which is how cognitive psychologists like to think about it, but it is a living part of your body. It is something that changes over time, just like your muscles do, just like your, any other part of your body does. That if you think about your muscles, if you use them a lot, which is really hard to do, but if you use them a lot, then they grow. Uh, and whenever they grow, you have, I don't know, um, more control over that element of your body. Um, and the same is true for, for your brain, that the more you use it, the more articulated some some functions might be, uh, or some 
I, I don't. Yeah, that's that's okay to say. I was gonna I was gonna say maybe that's too broad to say, but I think it's okay. Um, all right. So here we got this is the cerebellum helps us with our balance and such. Uh, here we have our uh, prefrontal cortex in the frontal lobe. We got our parietal lobe right around here. Well, actually no, probably closer to like right around here. Uh, this is the occipital lobe back here, and this is the ter the um, the temporal lobe. Um, okay, so this entire structure is made up of fat and neurons. So this is just a collection of all of this right here, all of it overlapping, all of it competing for resources with other neighboring cells, dying off, being pruned away, regrowing, and doing it all over again. Okay, so let's talk about some of these fundamentals of learning now. And if you have any questions about the about you know neurons and stuff like that, you're feeling insecure about that stuff, if you're feeling a little bit worried, just let me know and I'd be happy to like send you some videos or talk with you and be like, hey, here's you know, here's all about neurotransmission or whatever. Okay, let's talk about sensitization. So if you don't remember sensitization um, from Psych 101, maybe you learned about it in learning or maybe in applied behavior analysis. Sensitization is whenever you have a behavior that intensifies because of a repetition of that stim of a stimulus. Usually this is going to be for aversive stimuli. Um, and so um, the strength of that behavior is going to increase as time goes on. So an example of this for me to think of that that came to my mind is like thunder hitting or pff, thunder hitting lightning striking. That whenever lightning strikes, you jump really, really high, right? And if it seems like it's hitting closer, then you might jump more and more. And if that's the case, that is sensitization at work. That your behavior is becoming larger or more intensified as that stimulus repeats itself. Um, another example would be like sometimes, this is maybe a really random example, but like some people get really annoyed by smacking, smacking of the lips. And it's like they can't listen to like podcasts or audiobooks if there's somebody on the microphone eating because they can't stand that sound from the lips. Um, usually that's an example of sensitization where the first time people hear that, they're bothered by it, but that as it goes on, it becomes more and more unbearable. That's an example of sensitization. Another example to maybe think of a non aversive example, so one that is appetitive or rewarding, is thinking about. Uh, smelling something while you're cooking. So if you're hungry and you're smelling something, that stimulus, as you're exposed to it, as you have that repetition towards it, you're going to have an increased kind of um, uh, um, increased response. And it could be a salivary response where you're you're um, drooling over it, uh, or it could be a, a tummy grumbling response where, where your stomach is, is doing backflips because you're hungry. But the point in both of these is that our behavior is changing because of exposure with a specific subject. So this brings us to the first example of the aplesia. And I am going to say that uh, for some of this stuff, I will admit that like I don't know. I, I'm kind of conflicted watching them poke and prod this aplesia because aplesia, it doesn't, I don't think it, ha it doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't really have a brain the same way that we think about brains because it's an invertebrate. Um, but it is kind of, I don't know, it makes me feel weird that they're just kind of like poking at it all the time and that they're like administering these mild electric shocks. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up about that, that if you are especially sensitive to animals, that some of the stuff is going to be talking about. Um, research in the past tense uh, for these sea slugs um, in ways that feel a little bit iffy. Like I would not want someone doing this to my dog, for example. Um, so uh, the gill withdrawal reflex. This is a reflex that we're going to be talking a little bit about um, in in the next three units. Uh, and you may remember when I was talking about the sea slug, I mentioned that they have some very rudimentary behaviors and that that are built out of these reflexes. So a sea slug comes built with these they don't have to learn this reflex. And it's very simple, that you take a stimulus and you poke it somewhere near the gill of that sea slug. So the gill, as you know, um, uh, aquatic animals need gills to breathe underwater. Um, if you poke near it, 
then it withdraws its gill. It basically like tries to hide it. It brings it close to the body. Why do you think it does that? Why do you think it does that? It does that because it's trying to protect the gill. It's trying to protect it so that whatever poked it, you know, maybe it could have been a, a piece of coral, or maybe it could have been another fish. Whatever the cause might be, it wants to protect it because that is a vital piece of its body. But when people are studying this, they time how long does it take for that gill to relax afterwards. We're going to say that it takes 30 seconds for that gill to relax. Normally it takes about 4 seconds, but let's say, say for the sake of argument it takes 30 seconds after we poke that gill for it to relax. Now the first time I poke it, how long would it take? It would take 30 seconds. But if I touched it every minute for 20 minutes, what do you think would happen? Would it get faster in terms of how much it withdrew, or do you think it would withdraw for longer? There's a good chance that if I'm doing it like this, where I'm doing it every minute for 20 minutes, that it's so consistent that it withdraws its gill and it keeps it there until it's no longer being poked and prodded. This would be an example of sensitization. So why is it sensitization? Because as we, as we repeat the exposure of the stimulus, it changes the, um, the behavior, makes it more intense uh, for this species. Uh, so it's just going to withdraw its gill and hold it there, which is a more intense reaction than the first time we do it. All right, so I had these examples of sensitization. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a funny one second. I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the sea slug one first. So we're looking at a, an aplysia stretched out. We're going to focus in on the gill and the siphon. We're going to apply an extremely weak stimulus so you can see the amplification with sensitization. Weak stimulus to the siphon, you see a modest withdrawal of the gill. Now we're going to frighten the animal, startle it, give a noxious stimulus to the tail. That, of course, causes a contraction in its own right. This contraction lasts for seconds, but you can come back minutes later. The same siphon stimulus now produces a much more powerful withdrawal. We can now compare the two, normal and sensitized, and see how much more powerful the withdrawal is in the animal that is stalking. The memory for this event is a function of number of training trials. So if you give a single tail shock, plotting here, change in reflex strength is a function of time. The enhancement for, of the reflex lasts minutes. But if we give the same stimulus four or five times, we get a memory that lasts a couple of days. So we have a short-term memory and a long-term memory, and we can now look at the difference between them. All right, so that is uh, Eric Kendall. Uh, he is, uh, he's the guy for, for sea slugs. I think he won a Nobel Prize. Ooh. I'm pretty sure he won a Nobel Prize in physiology. Let me double check that. If so, because uh, um, it's always nice whenever psychologists win Nobel Prizes. Yes, physiology and medicine. Um, so, and that was in 2000. Uh, so, um, and he and he got that Nobel Prize for doing work like this, showing some of the very basic rudimentary elements of learning and of, and he even refers to it as memory uh, as well. Um, so in that case, what we saw is the normal kind of withdrawal, but whenever the animal is startled, that withdrawal happens for a longer period of time. All right, here is an example of whenever, um, uh, is, this is also sensitization. This dog's name is Mr. Bubs, and every time you talk to it, he seems to get louder and snarl more, so, which is also an example of sensitization. It's just a little bit cuter. Here we go. I love you, Mr. Bubs. Do you love me too? No? No. I think he loves me. Yeah, I got you. I got this on camera. <laughs> All right, so that was an example of sensitization. As speech was continuing, and uh, I guess they have a very popular YouTube channel because you can see them hanging out uh, together. Um, as, as they repeated speech towards the dog, it had a, 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 a continued and stronger reaction. All right. So we're looking 
Okay. Uh, all right. So here is kind of a quick diagram of uh, of a startle response, uh, where on the first day you got this mouse hanging out, it's just chilling. Second day it's just hanging out, it's chilling. The third day you create a really loud alarm. Uh, let's just say it's an auditory alarm. You created a really loud alarm, and then the next day, the the mouse is maybe worried, or the rat, I should say, is maybe worried about is there going to be another alarm? So its behavior may be a little bit different. If that's the case, that's an example of memory, right? The sensitization response has lingering effects on that organism. All right, so let's talk about habituations. Um, it's kind of the 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 other half. Of the of that basic learning dyad, we got sensitization and habituation. I feel like habituation for me at least is a little bit easier to kind of wrap my head around. Uh, but habituation is whenever you've been exposed to something so many times that you no longer have uh, uh, such a strong behavior. So it, it decreases with with it decreases in strength over time or over repetition. I'd say I should say. Um, and for me, when I was in graduate school. Um, uh, my spouse and I actually lived very close to some train tracks and every evening uh, the train would go by and when people would come over to our place you know to to have dinner or whatever they'd hear that train and they'd be like oh wow that train is pretty close huh and it was funny because my wife and I didn't really notice it right because we had been there for so long that we had just you know, kind of tuned it out. Um, those of you that live near Windsor Locks, I know that some of you uh, live near the airport uh, of BDL, um, of Bradley. Wait, is it Bradley? Yeah, yeah. Um, that if you live close to that airport, you f you don't really pay all that much attention to the planes coming and going. You just kind of get used to it. That's an example of habituation. That with repetition, we have a decreased kind of reaction to that behavior. Um, another example of this would be like the smell of your own home. So, you know, like whenever you go out on vacation and you come back, now you smell your home and you're like, oh wow, my home smells like something. Um, but right now, you probably don't think about how your house smells and you can't really smell it. Um, that's an example of habituation. You were, uh, you've been in your house for so long, you've been around it so many times that you fail to notice how it smells. Um, so here's an example of habituation using a real world example. Here we're looking at how many times you're getting a laugh at the dinner table versus how many times you hear a, the same joke. So the first time you hear it, maybe you're starting off and people are laughing, and then another similar joke, people are laughing, another similar joke, people are laughing. But as that same joke gets told over and over, the laughter response decreases. That is an example of habituation. Very simple, very uh, um, straightforward, I think. Uh, here is a fun video of habituation and dishabituation. So if habituation is whenever you decrease the reaction to a stimulus with repetition, dishabituation is then finding a way to reverse that, to get it to go back to the original association that we had. What does that mean? And Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll explain. Um, the example that I gave about uh, about living near the train tracks, I wouldn't think about how things. I wouldn't think about that train passing by. But if somebody called attention to it and they said, "Hey, that train is really loud," now I'm paying attention to it, and now I can. I know I'm perceiving you know, how you know, how close it is, that it exists, that it's nearby. Um, and that would be an example of dishabituation. Now, I've, now I perceive it again, now my behavior is more like it used to be um, before I habituated to it. So here is an example of that. So hello, today I'll be showing you the... Sorry, the, the captions don't seem to work on this one. And he has a little bit of a thick accent, so if you need to turn it up to, to hear him, uh, uh, go for it. So hello, today I'll be showing you the effect of dishabituation using this. 
case, what you saw, just to kind of go back to this, that initially with repeated exposures to that spider that eventually she habituated to it and no longer creeped her out, it no longer freaked her out, um, she gets bored with it. And you can see here after several trials, that's what happens, she has habituated to it. Now, whenever a new stimulus is created, a supernormal stimulus as they call it, a really big one, that this is going to essentially erase the effects of habituation, where now she's going to revert back to that initial behavior, which we see right here, which now she's afraid, now she's freaked out by this. All right, now aren't you glad that you don't have this guy as a roommate or as a study partner? Um, all right, so that is an example of habituation. Um, all right, to give you uh, an example of a non-human uh, um, uh, version of habituation, uh, let's talk about the acoustic startle response again. Usually, the acoustic startle response is kind of like a measurement of um, how long an animal freezes or how high it jumps whenever it is startled. And the idea is that if you can measure how long an animal freezes whenever it is startled, then you can measure how scared or how startled or how surprised it is. Um, so if uh, you play a really loud siren and you freeze up, then that means you're probably really afraid of that siren, right? If you just you stop for a second and then you keep going and you don't pay the siren any mind, then you're less scared of it. You're less surprised by it. So that's essentially the same logic that we're going to be looking at here with mice. So you have a, ma uh, a, a mouse, then you hear a clanging noise, and it spooks the, 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 the rat. We're going to do the same thing again. All right, this time, not as much of a startle response to that same stimulus. And then with enough trials, with that sound, now the animal doesn't care. Because, hey, the sound happened and it didn't hurt me, nothing happened. I didn't get food or whatever, but nothing bad happened either. So whatever, I'm just gonna pay. I'm just not gonna pay any attention. So the behaviorist approach to this is essentially that this is a decrease in the behavior, and the the word memory isn't really used there. But if we're thinking about um, uh, about what's happening, I feel like it's a pretty textbook definition for what we what we learned about earlier in the semester which is that we have um, uh, some exposure to a stimulus and that affects our behavior later on uh, which is exactly what happened here so here is an example of that you can see that this white rat right here um, this in a, a uh, what they call an operant chamber or a skinner box and they're just playing a really loud sound and you can see how this animal uh, habituates to that startle response. All right, so basically what we saw is, I'm just gonna mute it, but here at the first half of the video, the animal is stopping a lot and, and, and being you know very cautious, not really moving around. But as this goes on, especially right here, this is probably the longest startle response it has, but as that stimulus keeps occurring, and we see it you know occurring a lot, this animal no longer cares. Right, this rat's just like I don't care. I'm just I'm gonna explore because this sound doesn't mean anything. It doesn't hurt me. All right, let's take a look at um, at habituation for the sea slug. All right, so they are going to prod the siphon part of the animal, and so it withdraws and then after a few seconds it's going to release and they time it it releases after six and a half seconds now the next day they come in a day later and they're going to touch that same place let's see what happens it withdraws 
and then it begins to release at four seconds. So what we see here is an early instance of habituation, where before training happened, they poked it once, six and a half seconds it withdrew, and then it relaxed. After 24 hours, you do the exact same thing, and it withdraws, but it doesn't withdraw for as long as it would have before um, uh, this happened. So this is an example of memory, right? That this is habituation, but this is an example of the reason why this is four seconds, the reason why it's so low is because of the previous experience that it had with that stimulus. All right. Okay, um, so all known animals habituate, even slugs, sea slugs or land slugs, but even amoeba, like people have looked at amoeba behavior, which is so rudimentary, right? And have found that they do habituate. They, they habituate and they also have aversive uh, conditioning where you can train an amoeba to, to avoid specific kinds of chemicals. Um, which is, oh, that's such a weird sentence to say out loud. Um, so habituation is going to have essentially the same kind of mechanics across all animals. We looked at dishabituation, but we also can look at things like spontaneous recovery, stimulus specificity, short-term, long-term memory, and so on and so forth. Um, so just as a quick reminder of these two competing kind of uh, processes, we have sensitization, which is going to increase the strength of the behavior. It usually involves an aversive stimulus. You only need one trial for this to work, and it does generalize across other kinds of stimuli. That compares and or is the exact opposite of habituation, which is going to decrease its strength over time and repetition. Usually the stimulus is going to be seen as innocuous. In other words, it doesn't matter. It's just kind of boring. It doesn't, it's not bad. It's not, you know, dangerous. Uh, this occurs with repeated exposure instead of just one trial, and that is specific to the stimulus. So um, I was giving you an example of the train tracks going by. If it was actually an airplane for one night, I would absolutely hear the airplane. Um, because I, w I only habituated to the train there. Okay, so isn't this a memory class though? I tried to, um, to make sure that this felt a little bit like memory by talking about it in terms of memory. But what I wanted to kind of do is take a step back and say, well, what's actually going on here? When we are experiencing habituation and sensitization, what's happening ultimately is that when we experience something, it, um, part of our brain changes, part of our nervous system changes because of that experience, um, especially if it's a new experience. So when we experience something, our brain changes to reflect that we have experienced something. So we have fundamentally changed part of our body whenever we learn something new. Um, you can think of it as like we have retained something from the past whenever we do that because we have anatomical evidence to show that we experienced it because the brain subtly changes uh, over time and repetition. So this brings us back to aplesia. This brings us back to the sea slug. Let's take a look at how exactly this results in um, uh, structural changes when we are exposed to things. So as a reminder, the gill, gill withdrawal reflex, you touch near the gill, it retracts, and we're ultimately interested in how long does it take to relax. Over time, they are going to habituate. So you poke it somewhere, and if you do it inoculum, like where it's not super painful or whatever, um, it's going to uh, withdraw, and then it's going to relax. Whenever it realizes that it's it's safe, that it's not gonna get hurt, um, uh, it does it. So why does that happen? Why do we see something that looks like this, where the first couple of times you do it, it you know it takes it withdraws for two and a half seconds, but then after you do that, the next few trials, it only does one and a half uh, seconds of reflexing, or even less than one second um, of reflexing. Why does that happen? It happens at a neural level. So this is kind of a I was gonna say this is a simplified version of it, but because we're talking about sea slugs, it's really not all that much simplified because it's already such a very simple. Uh, species. But basically what we're looking at is the part of the anatomy, so the siphon, the tail, and the mantle, and then the sensory neurons that might help us detect that we've been touched there. So if we were touched on the siphon, 
that's going to stimulate the sensory neuron responsible for that area, which is then going to communicate to the motor neuron. That motor neuron is then going to communicate that to the gill muscles. If you do this enough over time, these connections might change a little bit. Um, ultimately, what happens is that if you are um, uh, 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 if you are, let me think about this for a second. Let me give you an example. Oh, very easy example, actually. Let's say that you just don't use your left hand, that you mostly use your right hand, you use your right arm to do stuff, and you don't really do stuff with your left hand. You don't really write with it. You don't really play an instrument with it. You just don't really do any, anything much with it. What would happen is that that information, the, 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 the neurons that allow you to kind of facil facilitate connections between your left arm and other parts of your brain, might atrophy a little bit. They may be pruned away. They, they may lose some of those connections so that it's not as easy for you whenever uh, you are trying to use your left hand. But if you decide to start using your left hand a lot, then you get better at it and you can start learning to write using your left hand. And in that case, we're going to be talking about that. Well, I will be talking about that a little bit differently. That's another form of, of kind of how experience might change uh, our, our anatomy. So instead of touching near the gill, let's say that we are going to shock it near the gill. That's going to create sensitization, right? Because we're talking about a, an, an aversive, noxious stimulus, and we're doing it once really hard or really, really strong, and that changes uh, um, uh, uh, the, what, what's going on in the brain there. So in the case of sensitization, what we're seeing is that, let's say that we shock this tail, that sensory neuron is going to be active, but it is also going to try to find other nearby neighboring neurons that are going to help us communicate with the other uh, sensory neurons. That way we can have a strong reaction to the gill muscle. So ultimately what happens is that whenever you repeat this, or actually you don't even have to repeat it, but if you do it and it's noxious and it happens one time and it's strong, that sensory neuron is gonna be communicating with any available neurons. And let's say it activates this neuron that it doesn't normally have in contact with, doesn't normally, uh, it is connected with. That neuron then is gonna to try to relay that uh, um, message to the one neuron that you know is that is also close by, which is the sensory neuron, which is getting feedback from this neuron too. So now the sensory neuron is kind of getting information from two separate neurons. And that is going to create a more pronounced behavior as a result. So having something like shock can release different kinds of neurotransmitters. In this case, uh, a shock actually releases serotonin, which um, some people might be surprised to hear because serotonin, uh, we usually think about it in terms of pleasure, I feel like, is how we normally refer to it um, uh, in or sleep even um, when, when people are talking about this online. And serotonin is going to modulate what neurons are, are going to release downstream to other uh, neighboring ones. So basically, if you can increase serotonin production, that can increase the total number of connections that you can make further down the line, which is exactly what we see here. So that way it creates a stronger connection between those two things. Um, the, in fact, I do want to go back and say one more thing about this, which is that if you are touching this siphon and it's activating the sensory neuron here, and you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and nothing ever happens, then ultimately this sensory neuron is going to stop communicating that to the motor neuron because it's not needed. Uh, because it's not resulting in any kind of meaningful thing, uh, any kind of meaningful productive uh, behavior. And so you can experience more and more sensory information on your siphon, and it doesn't result in a gill muscle retraction, which is the neural basis of habituation. I just wanted to make sure that I said that in black and white like that. Uh, and that's it. That is this unit. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, next unit, we're going to be talking about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So, it'll be fun. I will see you there. Bye-bye.